Our scripture reading this morning on this, the reign of Christ Sunday, comes from one of Paul's letters to the church in Ephesus and his prayer for that church. So listen to and for God's word this morning. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know God, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which God has called you, what are the riches of God's glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of God's power for us who believe according to the working of God's great power within us. God put this power to work in Christ when God raised him from the dead and seated Christ at God's right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And God, has put all things under Christ's feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you. I have heard of your faith and seen your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ at East Liberty Presbyterian Church and your love for all the saints. And therefore, I genuinely can say those words of Paul, give thanks for you, for you, the saints, the holy ones of East Liberty Presbyterian Church. Now, I know some of you may be visiting here today, but you may apply this to yourselves as well. On Tuesday night, myself and Pastor Heather met with the session of East Liberty Presbyterian Church and for a portion of time, the pastoral nominating committee. And we invited the elders to share one thing that they were thankful for, proud of, if you will, of East Liberty Presbyterian Church. And with their permission, I wrote some of those things down and told them that I was going to share them with you this Sunday. So here are some of what the leaders, the elders, the session of your church are thankful for of this church and perhaps of you in particular. I give thanks for those who have come before us upon, upon whose shoulders we stand. Uh, who have, for those who have maintained our congregation's commitment to justice and welcoming all. I give thanks for the rich and diverse offerings of educational opportunities to grow in our faith and being a part of the congregation that wants to continually grow and learn. I give thanks for the opening, open, welcoming, and affirming embrace of the LGBTQIA community, even when it was unpopular. It has been a beacon of hope to me. I give thanks, for here I have found a beautiful home, a place where I can think critically and rest and be safe as a whole person. I give thanks for how genuinely people care for one another and offer support and assistance, especially when in need. I give thanks for challenging sermons. Hopefully this is one of them. Afflicting the comfortable was this person's phrase and taking on controversial and difficult stands on social issues. I give thanks for that, we are, for that fact that we are a congregation that is always searching continuing to search and know and our willingness to pursue ways of self-correction. I give thanks for our vibrant worship and how we energize people to volunteer in service with our neighborhood. What about you? If you were to say a word or a phrase, ponder it in your hearts, what do you give thanks for regarding the faith 
of East Liberty Presbyterian Church. Or if you're visiting with us today, what do you give thanks for about your own home church community, perhaps where you grew up, perhaps where you were nurtured as a young adult or a child or as an adult? Allow that gratitude to fill your heart to sit with you this morning. Because as our African-American brothers and sisters often say in church, God is good all the time. time. A beautiful phrase and truth. Paul is writing a similar letter. It's the beginning of a letter he wrote to the church in Ephesus. And he does not end his prayer with the simple overflowing gratitude and thanksgiving he has for the church in Ephesus. Paul continues to pray to ask God to do and give more in and through these people in this church in the city of Ephesus. And perhaps it is his deep gratitude that compels him to pray for more. And I know it is for me as I stand before you today. I am very thankful for your faith. And I know that there is more that God wants to do in us. There is more that God wants to do through us. There is more that God wants to do for us. We at East Liberty Presbyterian Church continue to stand at a crossroads. A new path emerging in our journey as a community of faith, as a church. We are preparing to use another metaphor to turn a page on a new chapter in our life together. We as a church are in a time of transition, of new emergence emergence and redevelopment. So let's see together what Paul's prayer for the church of Ephesus says and how his prayer may encourage us as the church in East Liberty, Pennsylvania in 2023. Unfortunately, Paul is not thoroughly Presbyterian. He has four points in his prayer that I'd like to highlight today. If you're a tried and true Presbyterian, you know that good Presbyterian sermons have three points. But Paul prays for wisdom, hope, to know the riches of our inheritance and for power. First, Paul prays that God might give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation as we come to know God with the eyes of our hearts enlightened. Oh, how we all need wisdom and revelation. How we need the eyes of our hearts to be enlightened. Now our scriptures, if you read kind of curiously through the Bible, tells us a few things about wisdom. The first is that anyone who lacks wisdom should simply ask God for it, which Paul is doing. The book of Proverbs tells us that wisdom is with the humble and those who take advice. So for me, and just thinking about those three little aspects of wisdom, wisdom comes from asking for help and being interdependent upon God and others. I don't know about you, when I think of a a wise person, I look at a wise person and I think, man, how did that person become so wise? And I don't often think that that wisdom came from that person admitting that that person doesn't have the answers and asking for help, being humble, and seeking the advice of other people. Now what is wisdom, right? Simply put, wisdom is applying what we know and understand to our specific situation. It is taking knowledge and understanding and putting it into action. Wisdom is also a grace given to us by God's Spirit who leads us and gives us illumination and guidance and discernment and understanding about how to keep in step with the leading and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Wisdom is not simply gaining intellectual knowledge. It is the application of knowledge and requires us to listen and be open and adaptable and flexible as we seek to make decisions that aren't always guided by right or wrong, good or evil. But there is discernment that's required. It is a spiritual reality. And the more we ask God, 
the more we humble ourselves and are open to taking advice of others, the more the wisdom of God will be given to us. So I wonder with you this morning, as you hear this description of wisdom and Paul's request for wisdom and revelation in the eyes of our hearts being open to God's direction, what stirs in your own soul this morning? Where is it that you need and are seeking wisdom in your life? As you gaze upon this church, where does ELPC, East Liberty Presbyterian Church, need wisdom this morning? in this season of our life. Intentional pause. I know that the pastoral nominating committee needs wisdom. Amen, Polly? The search for a new pastor is not simply finding someone to fill a job. It is searching with other people having listened to you the congregation and trying to align oneself of a group of nine people in the flow of the Holy Spirit now that might sound fun and exciting and also might find sound daunting to you but this choice this exercise of seeking a new head pastor requires deep discernment and prayers for wisdom as I preached this sermon in Journey this morning, someone came up to me afterwards and said, I so appreciated your sermon, particularly the prayer for wisdom, because I've been asked to consider being an elder next year here at ELPOC. And it reminded me that our nominating committee, which sounds so perfunctory, does it not? It's not a perfunctory committee. This is a group of people that is praying and discerning who might God lead, who might God nudge to lead the church as an elder or a deacon in the coming years. I know our finance chair, Tiffany, will be speaking in a few moments about stewardship. And our finance committee and our elders will be meeting next month to set the budget of the church. And yes, we need good financial and accounting practices, but we need wisdom to know how to set the budget of our church in accordance with our mission and vision and how we spend and steward the resources that God has given us. I just give you those three practical examples of where we can be praying this very simple prayer for other people in the life of our church. Secondly, Paul prays that with that spirit of wisdom and the eyes of our heart enlightened, that we may know the hope to which God has called us. And turn that phrase into a question. If you know me well, you know I love questions. What is the hope to which you are called? If you think about your life and the way that you want to live your life and embody yourself in this world, what is the hope to which you are called in this world? What is the hope to which the collective us, the we at East Liberty Presbyterian Church are called? Perhaps think about it this way. When you first remember encountering the divine, encountering God, however you understood it at that time, in the person of Jesus, in the movement of the Holy Spirit, God in the church, however old or young you were in that moment, when you first encountered your own calling, what hope stirred in you? What caused you to say, I think I believe in God? I think I like this Jesus guy. I think I want to follow the movement of the Holy Spirit in my life. What hope stirred in you in those early moments, those early realities of your calling? Perhaps that was a glimmer. Perhaps that was a seed of hope given to you by God that defines your calling moving forward. And what about church? whether you're here at East Liberty Presbyterian Church or another church, what is the hope that stirred in you in those early days of coming to this church or another church and say, you know what, these people are okay. I think I want to put my shots in here. 
I think I want to invest in here. I want to become a member. I want to become a friend of East Liberty Presbyterian Church. What was it that drew you to this particular community or a community that you're a part of? That might be the Holy Spirit planting a simple seed of hope that is your calling in this time, in this season of your life. However you experience the hope of your calling, be reminded in this moment that that some kind of hope stirred in you and the one who called you is still with you. And that reality is still in you, in us, and wants to be shared with others. Your calling and our calling is true and it's real and it's right here. It's right now. It may be unseen. It may be a little dormant or hidden. But we can pray with Paul and like Paul for that to be rediscovered and to grow and deepen in us, between us, and spill out into the world as a hope to others. That they, may, that they may sit in another day and time and say, I had a conversation with that person and it instilled hope in me. Whenever I use this word hope, I'm reminded of other words of Paul who says this. For who hopes what one already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. As you reflect on the hope of the past, of your calling, what is that hope that's stirring in you in this present moment? This is part of Paul's prayer as well. And thirdly, Paul prays that we would know the riches of our glorious inheritance. This, to me, is another one of these phrases that, as Sarah so beautifully did this morning, tried to explain to kids, why do we call Jesus king when we don't really live under a kingdom anymore? And to be honest with my own confession, the whole reality of kings and kingdoms and queens stirs not so great in me. Inheritance, to me, is another word that feels very distant from much of our modern-day reality. But track with me with this. If Jesus is the Son of God, and we are all adopted into God's family, and therefore we are siblings with Jesus, we inherit all that Jesus inherits as the firstborn Son of God. So the riches of our glorious inheritance that Paul says in this beautiful phrase is that we have and are inheriting all that Jesus has in our personal life and our corporate life together. As it's said elsewhere in Scripture, we are partakers in Jesus' divine nature. The riches of our glorious inheritance are both at work in us now and they are a hoped-for future. And we see the riches of this glorious inheritance, which is Jesus's, whenever the realities of heaven come to earth. Whenever the realities of heaven come to earth, that that is the riches of our glorious inheritance. For instance, whenever bitterness is turned into compassion, Whenever greed is turned into generosity, whenever mourning is turned into dancing, whenever foolishness is turned into wisdom, when divisions and separations dissolve and disappear, and when different tribes and tongues and nations gather together before the throne of Christ. This is our glorious inheritance, a future hope and a present reality. In short, our inheritance is whenever God's holiness purifies and heals the realities that are unholy and broken in us, in the church, and in the world. The riches of our inglorious inheritance are when justice flow like a mighty water, when strangers are welcomed, when instruments of war and violence are turned into instruments of gardening and flourishing. So let us pray with Paul and enact our glorious inheritance now, in this moment, which leads to Paul's fourth and perhaps, in my opinion, most powerful prayer. Paul prays that we would know the immeasurable greatness of God's power working within us. Let me just say that again. Paul prays that we may know the immeasurable greatness of God's power working within us. If our calling looks backwards 
and our inheritance looks forward, then it is God's power that is in the present moment that sustains, inspires, and emboldens us to act and live in the here and now. The decisive power of God that Paul prays for, we will know more and more of, is demonstrated, he says, in the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Christ, is seated, ruling and reigning over all other rival powers. This, my friends, is what we celebrate on this last day of the church calendar, the reign of Christ and his power over all, in all, and through all. God in Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, has ultimately defeated two realities that we as humans are powerless to overcome death and evil as much as we try we cannot avoid death but god's power at work in us at work in jesus brought jesus back from the dead making him the first one to be reborn among the dead and that same power says paul that raised jesus from the dead is at work in each in every one of you it is our power, and it is our inheritance. And so we pray with Paul, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. But Jesus did not only rise again on the third day, but he also ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, ruling, reigning, and praying over every power, authority, and dominion. Things we can see and things we can't see, physical and spiritual, emotional and psychological, in this age and in the next age. And in particular, Jesus rules and reigns over powers that resist his authority and establishment an establishment of his kingdom of peace and righteousness and love and justice. Now we all know through our social media feeds and the 24-7 news cycle and walking out of our doorstep that evil is alive and well in this world. We see it in our own hearts if we're honest. We see it on social media. We see it in our streets, in our workplace, in the church. There is war and poverty and the earth groans from its suffering and the litany of isms that we could fill out today that we choose to alienate and impress the other, whoever we deem to be different from us. But remember the context of these words. Paul is praying. He's opening a letter to a church, and he's saying, I'm praying for you. And the eye of prayer lays hold of the realities that are not yet and applies them as though they already were. Let me say that again. The eye of prayer lays hold of the realities that are not yet and applies them as though they already were. Essentially, we say, God, please bring heaven to earth. And in fact, Paul proclaims that God has put all things under Jesus' feet and made him the head of the church. And the church is the body of Christ, the fullness of Jesus who fills all in all. This to me is deeply encouraging and deeply challenging. The body of Jesus, the church, is Jesus Christ's body here on earth. The body of Jesus, the church, is the fullness of Christ's power filling everything. And let me make it a little more personal. East Liberty Presbyterian Church is the power of God in the world. The power of God is at work within us and is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ever ask or imagine. 
And prayerfully, we are the embodiment of God's wisdom, the unseen hope, the fulfillment of Christ's inheritance, and the fullness of Christ at work in the world, filling everyone and everything, everywhere we go. Amen. As Teresa of Avila wrote 500 years ago, Christ has no body now but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks, compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes. You are the body. Friends, I have seen and heard your faith as your pastor, and I do not cease to give thanks. Your session has seen and heard your faith, and they do not cease to give thanks for you. And we pray that God may give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation. We pray that God may enlighten the eyes of our hearts so that we might know the hope to which we've been called. We pray that we might know the riches of our glorious inheritance. We pray that we may experience the immeasurable power of the reign of Christ, raised, ascended, and ruling all things, especially your own life and this church, knowing that you are filled with God's power to be Christ's body, hands, feet, eyes, filling everyone you meet, every nook and cranny that you walk into this world. And by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, may it be so. Amen.